She was giving hugs out for free. Anyways, yeah, so, uh, so like Nathan said, you know, we started last week into the book of Colossians, and um, we didn't get very far, and uh, we're still not going to go very far today. Um, I, feel like, I feel like, you know, God just wants me to kind of sit here and stay on, on what we were kind of looking at last week um, in this place of, of, of holy, uh, God's holy people and faithful brothers and sisters, right? And so we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit more today. But did, uh, did, did anyone get into the book of Colossians this week? Yeah, we got some hands. Awesome. And was God speaking to you? Yeah? I know that I've got some notes today of things that people want to make sure that I hit and, and go through. So in time, we'll get there. Um, you know what? If we're just doing like two verses at a time, we might be here for the next year. Uh, I'll try to pick it up a little bit. But I actually, I want to make sure that we stop and stay and we talk about some of the things um, that, uh, that, I, that I believe that are for us for now. Okay? And so last week, um, in Colossians 1.1, it said, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and from our brother Timothy. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God, our Father, give you grace and peace. And so we, we stop there and and we're not going to go any, any farther today. I talked a little bit about how, you know, God identifies his people and then he describes them. And so we've seen that he says, this is to God's holy people. And then he says, faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And, um, you know, throughout, throughout Paul's letters, he says this. He says this quite a bit. In Romans 1.7, he says, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ. In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. And then in Colossians 1.2, we see that again to, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, just this, just this thing of identity that I believe that God is speaking to us is something that I want to, to round off just a little bit more today and kind of look at, uh, look at a couple of these things. And, um, you know, just this, this word holy. You know, is it, is it something close and attainable? Or is it distant and hard to grasp? Is it a religious word? Or is it just a linguistical word where we say things like holy smokes and holy cow? You know? What do you think that of when, we, when, when I say this word holy? As I was thinking about it uh, this week, you know, the term awful came to mind. And it's interesting that that word can mean two different things. It can me either mean that we're in awe of something, we're awful, or that it's awful and that's totally terrible, right? It's, so is this word holy to you, is it awful or is it awful? How does it come across? When it comes to God, it definitely means pure, perfect, to be revered above all, you know, he is undefiled, and I think that it really can be summed up by the word clean. He's clean. And I think uh, this can be hard for, for some of us to understand because we don't always seem clear, uh, clean and pure, do we? And then that could be the difference between it being awful or awful. It was interesting that, uh, Lisa, you brought up just like looking back into the Old Testament uh, this morning because, because I just want to look back quickly into the first covenant that God made with his people to kind of just to, to, to talk about holy. Um, the people of the first covenant or the Old Testament were called to be holy. Right in Leviticus 27, it says, Consecrate yourselves, 
therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And in Leviticus 20, 26, it says, You shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, for I the Lord am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. And so in this covenant, the people God separated were expected to be holy. Um, but it was for a purpose, and it was for a bunch of purposes, actually. But it was aimed to set people apart as God's holy people and to distinguish them from other nations, first and foremost. And God asked them to do all kinds of things. You know, not only so that their relationship would be focused on him, but also that other nations would see that they were set apart and were different and distinct from the nations that were around him. His plan for them was to be clean and to be separated. But, um, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't supposed to be about them being in a holy bubble with this, like, impenetrable force around them that nobody could get in and they couldn't get out. That wasn't God's purpose and intention for them. But it was living distinctly different despite the way the nations were living all around them. You know, God called them to be distinctly different because he is distinctly different. Now, of course, in the New Testament, it's a little bit different, right? We don't have to keep all the rules and regulations and ordinances and sacrifices and, and, and um, you know, observances of holidays and all of these sort of things. In the New Testament, Jesus is what makes us right. He makes us clean. He makes us holy before God, right? It's his sacrifice. It's because of his blood and his forgiveness. And these things make us clean. They make us holy. It says that Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven to earth. So we understand that, uh, you know what, there's two different kingdoms in this world. We talk about that quite a bit. There's the kingdom of light and there's the kingdom of darkness, right? And what Jesus did is he took us out of this kingdom of darkness, placed us in a kingdom of light where there's a different way of living, where there's a different king, where there's a different God, where there's a, where there's a different example with, where he wants us to be separated as his holy people, right? And in 1 John 1, 5 to 9, it says this, it said, this is the message we have heard from him. So John is saying, this is what Jesus said. This is the message we've heard from him and pro proclaim to you that God is light and in him no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so like the people of the old covenant, we're not going to be perfect. But unlike the people of the Old Covenant, we don't have to keep a bunch of regulations and sacrifices and observances to be holy. John shows us how to navigate this and he shows us how to be holy. He says that it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. He says that we are now holy so we should practice something. He said that we should practice the truth and walking in the light. It also says that we should be in deep fellowship with each other. And you know, I just want to say that uh, this is a lot more than just coffee time after a meeting on Sunday. Fellowship with God's holy people is deeper. It's unity, it's partnership, it's mutual support, it's encouragement, sharing resources with each other. It's building each other up in love, faith, and, and it's understanding each other. And so, this is this part of the kingdom, part of, uh, the, part of the identity of being God's holy people. You know, I really want to express that there's, there's an identity and then there's 
how we live our lives according to that identity. And so this Greek word holy is, it's, in the Greek it's hagios. And it means properly different, unlike something else. Hagios indicates being distinct, unlike others, and set apart for God's purposes. And for believers, it signifies sharing in the likeness and the nature of God. It's an amazing thing that that Christ gave us this ability to share in the likeness and the nature of God. But it means for believers that... um, being different than how we were in the other kingdom. You know, last weekend we we had a baptism and uh, we heard Zoe say that there was nothing for her in that kingdom, right? And now that's the same for a lot of us is that we actually want to live different. We want to live separate. We want to be in the likeness and nature of God and totally leave that lifestyle, right? But this has nothing to do with being morally better than someone else. You know, we call that being holier than thou, okay? But it does have to do with everything to do with being morally distinct and different from the other kingdom. If we're called to share in and reflect the nature and image of the Father who created us, then we're called into this place of being different and distinct, which is the description of the word holy. I believe that this, this should be one of the things that um, differentiates ourselves from the other kingdom in this world. It should be one of the things that attracts us to him or attracts people to him is that we're a faithful people. So in this identity that he calls us into, calls us into this identity of his holy people. Meaning that we're distinct, that we're different, that, we're, that we are becoming like him, that we're reflecting his image, that we're reflecting his glory. And then we see that because of that identity, he says that we can be faithful people, faithful brothers and sisters. Our identity is in Christ. So should we not reflect our identity? What in our lives confirms that we are indeed distinct and set apart? And we see that one of those things is the action of faithfulness. And last week, we kind of talked about the faithfulness of God. How he is faithful. You know, I believe that that's one of his primary characters. And people will say, well, God is love. Yeah, but love is faithful. And so if God's, one of God's primary characters is that he is love, then he is faithful. So if we are to reflect his image, then to be faithful is something that we should desire, that we should should set before our eyes to, to be faithful to him. And this word faithful in the Greek, it's, it's called pistus. And its root word is obviously faith, right? Which means to be persuaded of what is trustworthy. So would you say that you have faith in Jesus? And then does that mean that you are persuaded that he is trustworthy. Persuaded means that you've been convinced. 
I want us to consider this carefully. Are we fully convinced that Jesus is trustworthy? I mean, if we're honest, probably not, right? We're probably not totally convinced that he's trustworthy. We're on this path. We're, we're pursuing this, or, or our desire should be to pursue this. But the only way that he can truly show us that he's trustworthy is if we actually spend time with him, okay? Faith is not something that we can generate ourselves. Faith comes as we spend time with him. Faith comes as we yield our lives to him, as we learn to let him have control, as we let go of things in our life, when we let go of control and we allow him to prove his trustworthiness, our faith grows. Our trust in him go, grows. Our persuasion in him grows. And then his trustworthiness and his faithfulness becomes our confidence. And you know what? Faith is, faith biblically Faith is, is a confidence that we can have. You know, it's the trust that we have in his trustworthiness. And so, you know, this week I, I, I was watching this, this video clip. And it was, uh, it was a video clip from uh, Joe Rogan. And, uh, and he had Kid Rock on his, on his, on his episode. And I'm not endorsing... Uh, Joe Rogan or, or anything like that. I just seen this clip. I don't listen to it, but uh, it was actually from this guy who said, if Chris Rock can tell people, or not Chris Rock, sorry, Kid Rock. Do you know who Kid Rock is? Probably a lot of you don't know who Kid Rock is, but if you're my age, you'll know who Kid Rock is, okay? He's like a, he's like a, a white uh, southern rapper rock star, Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, he, he was fairly big in our generation. And so Kid Rock is on the Joe Rogan show. And this guy said, if Kid Rock can tell people about Jesus, so can you. That was like the whole, that was like the whole census of the video that I watched. But they had this dialogue, right? And, and Joe Rogan, he asks, um, if you could go to one place, and he was talking about in history, where would you go? And Kid Rock says, Jesus. And Rogan says, what if he's not there? And Kid Rock's like, oh, he's there. And Rogan, was like, and Rogan says to, to Kid Rock, he says, do you think there's a real Jesus? And Kid Rock says, mm-hmm. And Rogan's like, definitely. And Kid Rock's like, absolutely, 1,000%. And, he's, and then Rogan's like, what makes you convinced and Kid Rock, he takes this long pause, and he's just looking in the eyes of Joe Rogan, right? He takes this long pause, and he says, my faith. And you know, Rogan, he takes like even a longer pause, and he's looking, he looks up, he's quiet, and he goes, I mean, that's a good answer. Right? That's all that he had to say, right? Because of like the faith of somebody who was speaking to him in just total confidence. That yeah, Jesus is who he is. It was, just, it was an interesting conversation, but my point is, is that our faith can be persuasive if we are persuaded ourselves. When our faith comes from God, it's confident. And confident faith is faithful. No matter where we are in life, when we're persuaded that Jesus is trustworthy, we trust him. And if we trust him, we yield to him. We let go. Obedience is trust. Trust is faith. And faith pleases God. And it's this kind of life that would make us pretty distinct and distinguished from the world, wouldn't it? Yeah. 
Being faithful is the action of letting go and yielding our lives to him. It's about not being in control. And it affirms that we understand our identity in him, okay? And then if we, we go into like the practice of faithfulness, the practice of faithful, and we see, we see, in, we see that the, the Bible talks about faithful in different ways. Jesus talks about faithfulness in a couple parables and, and he uses servants and stewards. And you know, I know that some of us are going to say, that we are sons and daughters and not just servants. And that's true. And I'm glad to explain where I'm coming from from there, okay? The Bible and Jesus use many different examples and metaphors and parables to describe who we are. Whether we're his holy people, whether we're sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, servants and stewards, whether we're his temple, his body, or even slaves, whatever it is, the concepts are generally, that are generally emphasized are still the same. Love for one another, humility, being responsible and trustworthy, being loyal, devoted, willing, obedient, selfless. Okay, so whenever Jesus uses a parable, he's using it to describe something and it's not actually the parable itself that has the meaning, but it's what he has Behind the parable, that's the meeting. It should be even more important to us that we identify as sons and daughters. You know, servants don't have a choice. Sons and daughters do. In fact, it's the choice that makes it even more pleasing to God. As far as, as, far as the world or the other kingdom should see us, Paul says this. He says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 to 2, he says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of, a, of stewards that they be found faithful. And so we see this word faithful all over the place when it's talking about the people of God. The New Testament often portrays God's people as servants, emphasizing the idea of serving God, but mainly in the area of serving others. So, so when we think about serving God, it's not like, you know, we're just always doing things for God, doing things for God, doing things for God. Actually, what he wants and what he feels that serves him is that when we serve each other. This is often emphasized. Of course, we do, we do serve God in different things, in different ways, and those sort of things, but he often emphasizes the serving of one another. And if we're talking about being faithful, um, and in that context, the Bible uses metaphors of servants and stewards. And in biblical times, it was common for the sons to serve in their father's house. Sons were even expected to contribute to the, family, to the family's work and responsibility. And like I said, this wasn't just about serving their father dinner or, or, or doing his laundry or, or whatever we, we think of when we think of serving. This was, um, they were responsible for their father's house. It included taking care of agriculture, managing livestock, training, trading family assets, and anything else that the, that the family was involved in. But it was a way of passing down skills, traditions, morals, and responsibilities to ensure the continuity and the stability of the family. And that's what God wants from his family. He wants us to be trustworthy and responsible with his house. And I just want to say that Jesus didn't say that I've come to be God's son. He said, I've come to serve and not to be served. He knew he was God's son. That was the confidence that he had. That was the identity that he knew. He knew he was God's son. It's an identity that we should know. And when we know it, it causes us to act in a certain way. 
And so just going back to just the practice of faithfulness, you know what, there's a couple parables that, uh, that I want to get into. We're, we're not going to have time to get into both of them today, but um, the first parable is just the parable of the talents, right? Matthew 25, 14 to 30. And we're going to go there, so if you want to go there already, um, you can go there. That's Matthew 25, 14 to 30. That, that's one that we're going to kind of look at a little bit today in the practice of faithfulness. I mean, this is... Uh, how we can be faithful in what has been given us. The second parable that we'll, we'll probably not be able to look at in, for a couple weeks from now, Jacob, that might be you, man, is, uh, is uh, just the shrewd manager in Luke 16, 1 to 8. And two, it kind of talks about using what's been given us, not for just ourselves, but for the purposes of the kingdom with an eternal perspective. So if you guys want to just kind of go through things in the next, or these things in, a, in the next couple weeks, just, I know you've, a lot of you have probably read them, but read them again and, and see what's in there. See what God has to say to you. It's a little bit of homework, but um, let's, just, uh, let's just head into the parable of the talents here um, a little bit. Matthew 25. You know, Jesus is just coming off this parable of the ten virgins, uh, where he was emphasizing the need for his people to be awake, to be alert, to be prepared and found faithful when he returns. And he ends that parable in verse 13. And he says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And then he starts the parable of of the talents like this. In verse 14 he says, For it is just like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his possessions. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his own ability. And he went away on his journey. And so, I find no problem with us even saying That if it read like this, if it read like, for it's just like a father going on a journey who called his sons and daughters and entrusted them with with his possessions. And that's why I want to just distinguish between servants and sons and daughters and why we, we don't want to kind of get bent up on what that means. What the point of this is, is that he entrusts us with his possessions. And he gives us certain things according to our own abilities. And so each and every one of us have been given something from our Father that he entrusts us with, that he wants us to be responsible and trustworthy with. The NIV translates talents as bags of gold, okay? And so, just so we know that... uh, You know, we're not just talking about that God just left us like these talons so that we could go on America's Got Talons, right? Is that it's, uh, he's talking about his possessions and he includes money. And and sometimes this is where the rubber meets the road for us, right? When, When somebody from the front of a church starts to talk about money and do our butt cheeks clinch up a little bit. You know, I know mine do. Is there anybody out there who thinks like, I'll go to church, but they better not talk about money or the church just wants my money. You know what, listen, I don't care about your money. But Jesus seems to care about our money. We never talk about money here, and I'm kind of convicted about that, but it's a hard thing to do. But Jesus talks about money all the time. And it's mostly in the context of believers being faithful with it and having an eternal and proper perspective of it. And that's as far as I will go with money, is that Jesus wants us to have this eternal perspective 
in general with what we do with everything that he's given us. Is that it's not just a temporal perspective that we have in life when we're called God's holy people and then we desire to be faithful. It means that we're, des- that, that we're faithful with every aspect of our lives. Our gifts, our talents, our resources, our finances. Doesn't mean we just pour them all onto the ground and, and give them all away. It just means that we're entrusted with something and, we, and, and, and God wants us to be proven trustworthy with what he gives us, right? And so in verse 16, it goes on to say, the servants who had received, or the servant who had received the five talents went at once and put them to work and gained five more. And so just what I what I seen here is that it's no no matter where we are, no matter what we have, we can at once put whatever we've been given and entrusted to to work. So we don't none of us have any excuses for where we're at, because whether we've been given five talents or two talents or one talent, we've been given something. And and this guy, it says that he immediately went and put to work what he has been given. And each one of us have something that we can put to work for the purposes of the kingdom, for the purposes of being faithful to him. Right? And then in verse 17, it says, Likewise, the one with the two talents gained two more. But the servant who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned to settle accounts with them. And the servant who had received the five talents came and presented five more. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. And I think like this is, the, this is the attitude that pleases the Father is you gave me something and it gave me great joy to produce even more of what you gave me. It's not like a, it's not like a negative condemning thing that, that, we need to, that we need to make sure we produce and make sure that we serve, but it's this thing of like, Man, I'm so thankful that I've, been, that I've been brought into the kingdom of God. I'm so thankful that he has made me his holy people. I'm so thankful that he has given me something that I can give back to him in, in even more. That I can be entrusted with something that he's given me. That's like an amazing thing for us to think. And an amazing thing for us to desire is that I've been entrusted with something. And I've been proven faithful in what I've been entrusted Man, the first guy, that first guy with five talents, he says, you trusted me with what was yours and I wanted to be trustworthy with what you gave me. And just this thing of being faithful is it's not just about us trusting God, but it's also about God being able to trust us. In verse 21, it says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, a lot of us like to quote that and a lot of us like to think like, one day I want to hear that, well done, good good and faithful servant, or well done, good and faithful son or daughter. I mean, that's like an amazing thing. I want to hear that. I want to hear that as well. And he says, you have been faithful with a few things. I put you in charge. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into your joy. Enter into the joy of your master. Man, I just think like, man, faithful people, they're blessed. We get to enter into the joy of our master. What more could we ask for for desiring to be faithful with what we with what we've been given. I mean, that makes me want to be even more faithful and faithful to Him. Like Christina said this morning, she said, why don't you ask God what to do? 
Why don't you ask God what he wants you to do for your job, for with the gifts that he's given you, with the amount of money that he's provided you, with any of these things. Is What do you want me to do with it? And when we hear what he has to say, we just do it. You know, Christina said that there, there was like, there was like a, the, just a string of events in our life that just, just got us puzzled or whatever. And I shared this in prayer this morning, and I'm going to share it again. I just really believe that God wants to, to, to use uh, us as an example. Um, you know, just a whole bunch of things went on, and, and it left me just like in this place where I had to decide. I had to, I had to think. I was, I was thinking like, I thought this was from you, and, and then something else happened, and then why did that happen? And this string of events, and I just, I just sat down earlier this week, and, and I, was just, I just wanted to hear what God had to say about our circumstances. I couldn't, I couldn't quite call it, you know? And I just, thinking, I just started thinking that. I said to Christina, I can't call it. And she was like, well, is it the enemy? Is it, is it this? Is it that? And I was just like, I just can't call it. And it doesn't matter if it was just life or, or if it was the enemy attacking us or if God was trying to get our attention. I just couldn't call it. And, and I just sat there one morning and I just said, like, God, what do you want me to do in all of this? And man, he began to speak to me and he, and he said, just be still. I was like, how am I supposed to just be still? And then he said, just be quiet. And that's hard for me to do. But man, I just sat there and it was like, it was like the peace of God just came over me and, and my mind actually became silent and my soul became silent and my spirit became silent. And, and there was this, this, there was this, this, I don't know, overwhelming trust that came over my soul and I was able to just be quiet. And I just sat there for multiple days this week, just in this quiet. Just being quiet. Being still. Calming my soul. Not questioning God. Not getting angry with Him because of things that had happened. But just saying, you know what? I'm going to be speaking this message. I'm being faithful. And, and you say... I believe that that's part of yielding ourselves to you, trusting you, allowing you to show us that you are faithful, allowing you to show me that you are faithful, but I need to let go. I need to shut up. I need to be still. Even if the things that I want him to do aren't the things that he does. Even if he doesn't do what I think he should do, I need to trust in him that he is going to do what I need him to do. And just even in that, we just started to see kind of blessing after blessing after blessing come into our life. Once again, it's like, I can't call this. One of the things that we were waiting on him for and asking him for, we didn't get it in the way, in the form that we thought that we should or that we wanted to or that we were praying for. But he provided in a different way. And I remember on that date, you know, my wife was saying, oh, I'm praying for this and it's going to happen by this time. And I was just like, yeah, okay. I was like, I was like Sarah and Abraham. You know, when Sarah laughed because God said that she could get pregnant, and I was like, okay. And so on that day, on that day, I mumbled under my breath, didn't happen yet. Right? That's my heart. A few hours later, I opened a text message, and the provision that we were waiting for came. But it wasn't the way that we expected it to come. And so, I guess in all of this, it's, 
Are we letting Jesus persuade us so that our faith is confident? So that we put our trust in him and in his trustworthiness. Letting that peace transform our lives. And not just what can we do for ourselves, but letting him prove himself faithful. That's like an amazing thing for me. You know, it's something... It's something that I'm growing in. It's something that all of us can grow in. But, and I want, I want my faith to be so confident that when somebody asks me, why do you think that Jesus, or do you think that Jesus is real, that I could say definitely, 1,000%, why? Because of my faith. And they go, hmm, that's a good answer. You know, and so just, just to kind of sum some of that up is I believe that God, when he brings people into his kingdom, he does see us as his holy people. He sets us apart. He sets us apart from, from the kingdom of the world. It, he transferred us into a different kingdom. He sees us as a people who are distinct, who are different, who live their lives in a different way, not to be morally better, but to be morally different. You know, in the, when we look at the Old Testament and all the things that, that God required this people that he separated to do, the sacrifices and the Living in it, living a certain way personally, observing different holidays and all of those sort of things, so that they were seen as separate, as different, as distinct. And then they, they had to live out these certain things that they couldn't live out anyways. But God said, like, He required that of them to be holy. And then in and then for us. What he requires us to be holy is this, this trust and faith in the blood, the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that makes us holy. But then the things that he wants us to do are these things like reflecting his faithfulness, reflect my love, reflect my compassion. These are incense. This is the sacrifices that he wants us to have that distinguish us, that, that reflect his nature that show that we understand our identity and what he's done for us. These, these amazing characteristics and qualities that he wants the other nations of the world to see that that's what he is like so that they're drawn to be with him, right? That's like that purpose of that thing. And then just to be, to be faithful, for us to be faithful in that, to trust that he's going to provide what we need to be faithful people, to, to trust that he's going to provide the image and the reflection of who he is. Like, and then to walk out in that thing, to be faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who are responsible with what God has given us, that we're proved to be trustworthy with his possessions. Like, I don't know, that's a desire of my heart to be that kind of son and that kind of daughter. And I, and I hope that this morning, that this encourages you to even think about is like, am I a trustworthy son? Am I a trustworthy daughter? What are the things that he's given me? What are, the, what, are the, what are some of the possessions that he's given me that I can be more trustworthy in? All right? And so, yeah, so, so there, we're going to have a couple weeks off. We're going to go to Prince George. Like, 
Like Christina said, come and join us in Prince George. We're going to be talking about kingdom there. It's going to be, a, it's going to be uh, broader than, than uh, New Life Church or Quinell. It's, we're going to talk about kingdom and, and, and kingdom leadership and kingdom uh, vision, kingdom mindset, that sort of thing, uh, a little bit farther, uh, farther reaching. So it should be a great time. There's, you know, I've got guys just texting me from the NCMI team saying, man, I can't wait to see you on that weekend. And that's what the biggest things is, is that we build relationships with people across BC, across Canada, and, and even beyond that. And, and that's the most amazing thing for me is this these building of relationships, these kingdom relationships. So I just encourage you, if you didn't plan to go out, once again, come out for that weekend. We can help you if you can't, uh, if you can't make it financially. Um, and then uh, the weekend after that, right? Yeah, we have Kirk and Jan Slow with us, which will be amazing. Um, they are such great people. And so like Nathan said, just make sure to prioritize that and come and hear what they have to say. Gather with us in the different ways that we're going to be gathering over that weekend. And then, uh, and then yeah, we're going to be then we're going to be heading into uh, the Easter season and the Good Friday season where... You know what, pretty much uh, they've forced me to preach at the Good Friday message, so I'm pretty terrified about that. Um, but yeah, we'll figure it out, I guess. And, uh, and, and yeah, so, uh, so we will probably not be in Colossians for a little bit here, but um, continue to read it, continue to ask God what he has for you in there. Um, like I said before, if there's anything, if there's any places in Colossians that you say, I want to make sure that uh, you don't gloss over. I've already got some notes. That's great. Um, be free to 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 uh, bring those places in Scripture so that uh, we just can uh, we can get everything that we can out of it. And um, yeah, it's an amazing book. It's short, but it's amazing. It has so much good stuff in it. So. Yeah, I'll be reading that, and I'll just pray, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll be on our way today. God, I just thank you so much that, uh, that you are faithful. Man, and I, and I thank you so much that, that you had a plan and you had a purpose for mankind, and this isn't just, this isn't just about people who sit here. This is about, this is for every and anyone who desires what you've done for them in Jesus Christ. But it is about the cleansing blood and the forgiveness of Jesus. It is about his sacrifice. But man, what you've done for us when we've accepted that is absolutely phenomenal. And I just pray that we would, we would start to grasp this identity more and more and more and more and more. This identity of being your holy people, God. And then just what it even means to to be faithful, to be faithful brothers and sisters, to be faithful to you, to be faithful to each other, to be faithful with, with what you've given us, just that we would desire to be faithful with what is entrusted us and that we would be able to see you work in ways that we never even could fathom or imagine that you work. You're so great and you're so wonderful. God, I pray that you would just continue to, to reveal yourself more and more and more and more. It says that we would get the wisdom and revelation to know you better. That's our prayer for this body and for Quinnell and beyond is that we would have the wisdom and revelation to know you better and that that would change us. And so we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.